Welcome to the On Your Mind podcast, where we believe mental illness can be temporary and transformative. Stay tuned for innovative, effective tools from experts in the field of mental health. Hosted by Timothy J. Hayes, psychologist. This podcast aims to change the narrative around mental illness. Move from a place of fear to a place of hope and solutions. Here on On Your Mind. Dr. Kevin Gilmartin is a behavioral scientist specializing in law enforcement and public safety related issues. He is the author of the book, Emotional Survival for Law Enforcement, a guide for officers and their families. A police officer walks up to me, older police officer, probably in his mid-40s, and he walks up and he has a whole stack of those books that we're talking about, the Emotional Survival for Law Enforcement book. He has, I don't know, a little stack of them. And he goes, Dr. Gilmartin, can I impose upon you, sir? Would you do me the honor of signing these for me? I said, well, it'd be my honor. Who can I make them out to? And he looks at me and he goes, my ex-wives. I said, your ex-wives, plural. He goes, yeah, I have three of them. I refer to them as P1, P2, and P3 for plaintiff one, plaintiff two, and plaintiff three because they're always suing me. So I said, they're going to get a class action suit against you. And I think he's being lighthearted. But then I realized he's not being lighthearted. I said, you really want me to sign books for your ex-wives? And he goes, yeah, I do. I said, can I ask you why? I've never been asked to do that before. I've never had that request. Why do you want to sign books for your ex-wives? He goes, because I just want to say, I'm sorry. I just want to say that our divorces were 100% my fault. I've ruined the marriages. They didn't. Welcome. (laughs) Thank you for having me. (laughs) Just so you know, up front, I just want to promote this book. So, Oh, okay. Well, great. I love hearing that. I'm a psychologist with uh, 45 years experience. I started as a probation officer Mm. and uh, my tendency has to be results oriented and practical in whatever I do with people. And I recently had the wife of a law enforcement person tell me about your book. And I read it and then read it again and said, I got to get this guy on a podcast if it's possible. So, Well, I appreciate that. I hope the book helped your client. Yeah, yeah. And it's helped several other people. And so she just, she's in the same position that I am. She wants more and more people to read this because it was so much a description of her life with her husband. Mm. Mm. I actually enjoy hearing that. That was our point in doing the book. I'm not a writer. It was a struggle for me to put that in paper. Actually, the sales on that book have gone into several million right now without any marketing. It has just taken off across the U.S., Canada, Australia, and the cops are very pragmatic people, and they tell us the book helps them. So that pleases me. I like hearing that. What drew you to write a book like this, uh, Emotional Survival for Law Enforcement? You know, it was kind of ironic. The, the genesis of the book came about from a, uh, a conversation with an officer that I worked with during my policing career. He said very bluntly, he goes, you know, you need to write a book. I said, I don't want to write a book. I don't have any interest in writing a book. And he went on and said, well, you know what? That class you teach on emotional survival helps people. And when you die, the information dies. So you have to write it down. And I said, you know, you're a real pleasant person to listen to. You don't think the cemeteries are full of people who had something to say? I said, well, I guess they are. So that was my motivation to write the book. That was the sole motivation, just to capture some of the information that we had learned over decades of working with police families and hopefully putting out some suggestions that might help them. Not too far into the book, you cite that the Fraternal Order Police death rates put suicide as the highest for law enforcement officers. Yes, I remember citing that study that the Fraternal Order of Police did. You know, I don't think that has changed in the ensuing years since the book has been written. One of the paradoxes over the last, I would say, 20 years has been we have an increased awareness of mental health services for police. You would think that would translate into a decreasing suicide rate. 
But the best knowledge I can find is that it hasn't. We have an increasing suicide rate. So maybe there's something going on other than just traditional psychological issues. Maybe the men and women in the criminal justice system have some unique challenges that have to be addressed. I'm convinced of that. And that, that's what we try to talk on in the book. Yeah, I think you do a masterful job of that. You know, you're, one of the things you talk about is a matter of perspective, the worldview that's developed and how it, at one level, it works to help keep officers safe from that immediate danger when they're on duty. And yet it produces this hypervigilance that leads to a whole different set of problems if it's not addressed. Can you talk about that? Sure, absolutely. Because you, I think your question hit the nail exactly on the head and shows some insight into the issue that you personally have. Uh, in order to do the job as a police officer, as a probation officer, as a corrections officer, you walk into situations every day that have very intense consequences, life and death consequences. So what the professional does is they raise their level of alertness, which they have to do, which is required, into the state we call hypervigilance, which is a physical state. It's the elevation of the sympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system. Peripheral vision's increased, reaction time increases, that the officer's decision-making increases, and they remain in that biological state for the entire duration of their professional day. But when they get off duty, that biological response produces an equal and opposite reaction, and the body swings them from high sympathetic autonomic nervous system arousal into parasympathetic, which means when they get off duty, they drop into this biologically based depression. They become lethargic, detached, isolated, and they don't feel like doing anything. So the very state that is required to do the job safely is also the state that causes tremendous psychological harm in the criminal justice professional after work. But it also now, over the years, the research is showing, it also sets them up for a few very intense life-ending diseases that can be prevented. But that it's almost like a roller coaster swing. We call it the biological roller coaster. Intense engagement on duty with this exhausted state off duty. And they live between these two phases of their life. And it just doesn't work for people. They might do well for four, five, six years. But in the long run, it's a formula for disaster. You also talk about the kind of isolation that this brings out when after that's that cycle of living in hypervigilance has gone on within a person for so long, they need that kind of stimulation or at least perceived threat to get stimulation. And if they don't have it, they seem to disconnect from life. So the, the everyday discussions that people might engage in hold no interest for them because they're living on the edge so often. It really is a matter of biology and the biological reactiveness that law enforcement officers, for example, have to do. Every day, it's this heightened level of physiological, adrenal cortical-driven perception of the world. So what you're saying happens. They get off duty and there's, everything else is pretty mundane. You know, I just had to write a pre-sentence report on this person that's going to spend life imprisonment, or I knocked on the door and there were and that was an armed subject behind the door. Now I go home and you're asking me what color paint we should use for the kid's bedroom. I don't really care. It's irrelevant to me. The fabric of the criminal justice professional's life off duty, they basically unplug from it because many times they're really low voltage, just mundane aspects to life. But the other part is they're doing it in a biological state it's almost equivalent to depression. You know, when mammals face threat, the adrenal cortical response engages. Blood glucose elevates, blood pressure elevates, heart rate elevates, and they face the threat and they perform whatever tasks have to be to survive the task. But when they are removed from the threat, the body homeostatically goes in the opposite direction. Unfortunately, the family and loved ones 
of the criminal justice professional, the cop, only gets the bottom of this roller coaster. They get the backswing of the pendulum. So they end up spending their life with someone who's detached, who's apathetic, who's indifferent. And when the only time they get out of that depressed type state is when they go back to work. So you know, getting back to your question on police suicides, I think we've spent a tremendous amount of time talking about the psychological dynamics of suicide, but we haven't spent nearly enough time talking about the biological components in police officer suicides, the dropping into this profound parasympathetic state of apathy where they isolate from those aspects of life that actually give them psychological resiliency. You know, one series of studies found that in the first 10 years of policing, police officers reduced their physical exercise by 50%. So they graduate from the police academy, this very physically fit man or woman who has good dynamic strength, good cardio, can go out and run a 10K without any problems. Then within 10 years, we've had incremental weight gain, we've had the officer becoming very detached and physically pretty incompetent. The other aspect is there's also a 50% reduction in church attendance. And I use church attendance as an indication of social congregation. Not only do we reduce church attendance, we start finding police officers not attending club meetings. They pull back. They view people from somewhat of a jaundiced eye. And so they withdraw from those other social contacts. So the only engagement the officer ends up having is in their work role. Then their personal life becomes more and more increasingly isolated and depressive as the years go on. It's a formula for disaster in your personal life. You mentioned the, uh, the concept of the magic chair. To me, that sounds like if I'm the spouse of somebody who's in this cycle, that's a real good diagnostic clue for me to look at. Do you know, it is, but it's also generational, I'll tell you, because when we started writing about the magic chair, we were talking about cops that came home from work, plopped in this chair, and by magic, all their blood turned to lead, and they started just surfing through the channels of the television set. Now, as technology has changed and our world has become digital, we don't even really need the magic chair because we can just pop out our smartphone and we can disengage from life by burying our nose into social media or surfing through the internet and just totally ignoring what's taking place around us. And this almost digital addiction really plays into the, the issue, of the difficulty with, with uh, high-stress jobs. The person escapes the rest of the world by just fixating on the device in front of them. So now we end up with cops that are out dealing with very intense situations then they get off duty and they bury their nose either on the internet or they bury their nose in front of a television set. I had a, um, an encounter not long ago. I was doing a seminar and a young police spouse came up to me, several hundred people on the seminar and the conference. And she came up and I was speaking and she said, uh, Dr. Gilmartin, I'm so worried about losing my marriage. And she started crying. And I said, well, what's going on? She goes, my husband just goes to work, he comes home, and he just gets on the computer. He doesn't talk. We'll call him to the dinner table, and he'll eat, and then he'll leave, and he'll just go back into on his computer. He's always playing video games, or he's always looking at the computer. He never talks with me and the kids. When we go to parties, unless they're police-related parties, he just isolates himself in another room. And she says, I'm so worried I'm going to lose my family. And said, well, is your husband here at the training today? She goes, no, no. The chief of police didn't make it mandatory. It was optional. And he just, he thought it'd be just a bunch of junk and he wasn't going to come to it. So I'm just so worried about losing my family. And, you know, I have no doubt that without intervention, that police family will not survive and will lose another police family. And that's one of the tragic issues of having to practice officer safety. You go into the heightened level of alertness. Then when you come back, you drop into the depression off-duty. And it's that depression that destroys people psychologically, socially, and physically. I like that there are several different stories like that in your book and uh, summary, you know, case histories. 
detailing how when we let down from that hypervigilance, we drop below normal activity into that depressed level. And if people don't understand for themselves as the law enforcement individual or the family member that this is happening at, as you said, at that physiological level, then we attribute it to all kinds of other things like she doesn't love me anymore, he's not interested in us as a family, etc. So what have you found that's most beneficial when you see these things turn around? I tell you, um, education is training. You can't solve a problem if you don't know what the problem is. And I think I've been in this field for, oh gosh, closing in on 50 years right now. And I don't think we've made significant progress in those past five decades in helping police officers. I think we have wonderful professionals available to them. And when the officers form a trust relationship with that clinician, they get better. But it seems to me that if we rethink the problem, we'll come up with the accurate solutions. I'll give, for example, there's a cluster of events that occur. Why do police officers gain significant weight and firefighters don't? That's a question that's always puzzled me. Why do police officers, we know 83% have sleep deficiencies, and yet we still ignore that. Anytime somebody is faced with a threat, the body mobilizes its resources to address the threat. The adrenal cortical stress reaction occurs. They have high levels of adrenaline, and they perform in order to survive the threat. But that stress reaction is producing a lot of behind-the-scenes biological reactions that cause depression. Elevated blood glucose on duty means insulin is infusing glucose into fat cells around the abdominal area in order to handle a threat. So our cops get fat. They don't get fat because they eat donuts. They get fat because they have to practice officer safety and produce adrenaline. They drop into this depressive-like state. Well, that's what happens after a threat. The pendulum swings from the high left over to the high right. And our officers come home, and all their families and loved ones get is the opposite. They get the worst end of the deal, detached, isolated, indifferent. And our police officer now is starting to get incremental weight gain, is starting to get sleep disorder, and actually is entering into the movement towards diet, metabolic disease. Their glucose levels start being impacted. And by the time they're in their latter 40s or early 50s, we have well a too high a percentage of type 2 diabetic police officers with elevated risks of heart disease and stroke. And then we have premature death syndromes. And it all goes back to the same issues that in the early stages of the police career are the very need to move into that elevated level of alertness to do the job safely. So actually, the better the cop is operationally in the field, the more they're at risk emotionally and physically in their personal life. We have to do interventions with officers on a daily basis. And some of the interventions are so absolutely simple. For example, with depression, research tells us that walking briskly on a treadmill for 20 minutes a day is as effective in addressing the symptoms of depression as is antidepressant medication. Yet we very rarely find police departments that mandate moderate physical activity at the end of each shift for police officers. We know the Center for Disease Control says 150 minutes a week of moderate exercise will reduce type 2 diabetes by 60 to 70 percent. And Within our law enforcement population, that's one of the biggest killers of cops. So for an investment of 22 minutes a day, we can have a 60 to 70% alleviation of the biggest physical killers of cops, and we can treat depression as effectively as if the cops were on antidepressant medication, and yet we'll still talk about police suicides, and we'll still deal with police marriages ending, when there might be a simple, one part of a simple solution right in front of us that we're ignoring. Well, that's powerful. I'm, I'm glad you're out here trying to help educate people about this. Another critical piece that comes up in your book is how the police officer 
shifts their sense of identity and how once they've done that, it leaves them vulnerable. Can you talk about that? Well, certainly. You know, people are a complex constellation of roles in our life. We might be a mother, a father, a little league coach, a church member, a cop. There's these multiple portfolios in our life. But what police work requires is a tremendous amount of investment in the police role in order just to stay alive. The cop has to place a lot of emotional energy into that cop role. They're at the top of this roller coaster. Then when they get off duty, that's when all those other roles occur. The role of fisherman or motorcycle rider or baseball coach. And those roles, those non-work related roles, stop getting invested in. So as the years progress, the police officer's professional role as cop starts taking the air out of the room. It starts having 90% of their emotional investment. They don't say, I work as a cop. They say, I am a cop. So their identity becomes singularly defined and linked to that cop role. I am a cop. Well, the problem with that is mental health requires that we have control over many parts of our life. The realities of police work is that when you're working as a police officer, you're working in an authority-based hierarchy where someone further up the command chain controls what you do. So you find officers after a decade become extremely resentful of management. They become extremely at odds with the bosses. And the reason for that is the bosses control the police role, and the police role has become their world. You can set cops into an emotional crisis by just making them put a hat on. And there's this huge emotional overinvestment of volatility over an issue that really isn't that significant. But to the officer, it is because stress is when someone puts high demands on you and they have low control. I'll give an example. I can remember speaking with a person that I knew who flew the Blackbird, the SR-71, the supersonic aircraft. And I asked him, I said, Jim, how fast did that aircraft fly? And he said, that aircraft could cruise at 2,400 miles an hour. And they said, wow, that's fast. I'd hate to be a passenger in a plane flying that fast. And he goes, I would never be a passenger in a plane flying that fast. I will fly it, but I'll never sit by and just be a passenger and let somebody else fly it. That's what police work is. The cops put all of their eggs in an emotional basket of cop. Then somebody further up the command chain than them controls the basket. And it can be devastating. It's not just disappointments, but their whole life shatters because of that. And they actually become very emotionally vulnerable and very fragile. We have to have our officers remain well-rounded, flexible, members of the community. But that requires dealing with the bottom of that roller coaster and dealing with the after effects while they're in the depressive state and getting them out of the depressive state. Well, and as you say, you point out so clearly that because it is this bureaucracy-driven system, it's virtually impossible to be in the system for 15, 20, 25 years without getting screwed somehow. Oh, absolutely. Well, that's all a relative term. If I'm the chief of police and you're one of my officers and I tell you to put a hat on, I'm not screwing with you. I'm just telling you to put a hat on. It's not an emotional decision. But if I link emotion to every time someone directs my role, I'm going to think I'm getting screwed constantly. And this is one of the big misperceptions of many police officers. You'll hear police officers say, the biggest source of stress in law enforcement is management. And I always find myself telling them, no, it's not. The biggest source of stress in law enforcement is management controls things that you're emotionally over-investing in. I don't want you investing emotion in a hat policy. I want you investing emotion in your children, in your marriage, in your physical fitness. You know, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. And one of the most difficult 
aspects that destroys police lives, ironically, is their emotional commitment to the job. This is the paradox. The cops start their careers as sprinters, but they're in the marathon. So everybody's a good cop for four or five years. Then at that point, from then on, some are emotional survivors, and they can maintain their professionalism and their ethics for the rest of their career. But some very clearly become emotional victims, and they have this angry resentment towards first supervision and then towards the public as in general. And they're very destructive police officers. And usually, if you scratch beneath the surface, they've become misguided. They've lost the trail somewhere along the way. That's a failure of the profession in not providing guidance and direction to these officers from the beginning of the career. Very few people are apathetic about their policing career. It's a career of heavy emotional investment, and we just need to be better able to help those officers know how to get their journey through this career. Yeah, it's powerfully written. I, I really like, you know, you've got the case history about the officer who has to go on this rotation of working in a jail and doesn't really want to go through that rotation, but takes it personally, as you said, is so emotionally invested in one thing over the other. And then the difference between core values and situational values takes over and makes an ugly mess of things. Yes. I like the statement you make where when the good cop gets angry, doesn't show their victim status by going out and doing something wrong, they go out and stop doing something right. Yeah, absolutely. Acts of omission are the first signs police officers are corrupting. You know, when you look at major corruption issues that have affected police departments around our country. And when you scratch beneath the surface, you wonder, how did these good cops get tied up in this bad behavior? And you almost always find a rationalization of victimness. And they screwed with me, therefore I will screw with them. I often think of when I'm teaching classes to cops, sometimes I'll play a, uh, a country western song where a woman is vandalizing her ex-boyfriend's car. They're outside this nightclub. She's running her key down the side of the guy's car and slashing up the tires on the car. And she can rationalize this because the ex-boyfriend, you know, is running around behind her back and she's been victimized by this ex-boyfriend. But she's able to rationalize criminal damage and vandalism, which ultimately gets her arrested. But Good cops do this quite frequently. You know, you're going to make me wear a hat when I step out of the car? Fine, screw you. I won't step out of the car. So you'll see a, a disengagement from activity. Some of our major cities have had significant increases in homicide rates because the cops just take a knee. They don't engage. They'll, they'll say, you know what? You're never going to get in trouble for the traffic stop you didn't make. And they just pull back. And unfortunately, when we permit cops to see themselves as emotional victims, all of society loses. We have to see cops as vibrant members of the community who are doing a really difficult job. And this is right now, currently, I personally think this is one of the most difficult times that I've ever seen in being a police officer. It's almost open season on police officers in terms of media attacks in terms of accusations, every social ill and injustice that exists in American society, we get to blame the police officer for. There appears to be nobody championing the men and women of policing. And they're doing, they're trying to solve, in many time, cases, unsolvable social issues. Well, I couldn't agree more. I think, you know, that the whole issue of blame or the whole process of blame, I often tell people, I've never seen blame lead to the productive or constructive resolution to a problem. So we can scapegoat. Anyone can become a scapegoat, and we can scapegoat anyone. One of the things I really like about your book is that, you know, by the time you get to Chapter 8, you're starting to talk about how to become an emotional survivor, and you're giving some practical steps. The difficulty is, as you said, it's the education what have you learned about what's the best way to get this education started or dispersed into law enforcement 
departments? If I were king for the day and I could wave a magic wand over the police world and implement some training, the first thing that I would do is I would implement training in emotional survival for police officers at least once a year throughout the course of their career. And it would incorporate training for their family members. Having these officers take a look at how their career has changed them. And you know, it's interesting. There are some projects around the country that are doing some really interesting, innovative things with their police officers. One department sits down and videotapes their officer in a discussion and asks a series of questions. They capture this on video. Then they come back at the five-year point and ask the same questions and have the same discussion again, and then they compare them. Then they do it at the 15-year, 10 and 15-year point. Every five years, and they've been doing this for a number of years, It's very, and the officer gets to see how they have changed. So putting an emphasis on this and not just paying lip service to it, you know, not just having some type of an employee assistance program that wins the contract because they were the low bid entity, but having men and women who are dedicated to understanding criminal justice professionals and are truly have a passion for helping them. And that's starting. We're starting to see professionals such as yourself, whose career began in the criminal justice field. Now you're a psychologist. We start to have this cadre of, of cop docs that are out there who are law enforcement professionals but they're serving the cops from a, from a behavioral scientist perspective now. So increasing that emphasis would be the first step that I would implement. And if I still continued in my reign as king of the police world, every police officer, every dispatcher, every probation officer would have a half hour a day of mandatory physical fitness training for every shift that they work. It wouldn't be optional. It would be mandatory, and it would deal with undoing the damage of hypervigilance, undoing this cardiovascular issue that kills police officers. When you produce adrenaline because of stress, you start infusing glucose. That causes into the fat cells. That causes, after a period of time, insulin resistance, which leads to diabetes, heart disease, and stroke. It's a very predictable progression. And it's very easy to derail. And we certainly do that. I would also start looking at mandatory sleep hygiene training. We do far too little to deal with the issues of sleep deprivation and decision making. But I guess what I'm saying is I would take the survival of our police officers and push it to the front burner, not some ancillary back burner window dressing approach. We'd, we'd take it very seriously. Well, I was very uh, glad to hear you say in the beginning there that you would include the families and spouses because there's such a tremendous benefit in my work with people when I can get the spouse to understand that what he or she is experiencing from the law enforcement person is not being caused by a deficit in the spouse. You know, Many times I'm asked to speak at a police graduation. They're graduating from the police academy. And I'll be sitting up there on the stage and watching all the pomp and circumstances and stuff going on. And the chief is talking and they're introducing the new class of police officers who take their oath of office and they're issued their badge. And then you're sort of a keynote speaker. You're supposed to come up and in 15 minutes drop some pearls of wisdom on them. But as I sit and I look at the audience, I'm always reflecting on these young families because they're typically young men and women in their 20s and 30s. They have young families. Many times their significant other is sitting out in the audience with their children. Many times they're still being in a child carrier. And, and now all I reflect on is, is I say, okay, now you better say something to try to preserve this family because this young couple right here is sharing their life with each other, and they love each other. But you know from your years of working in this field that the majority of them are going to go their separate ways, not because they don't love each other today, but because they're going to engage in a life that they're going to grow apart from each other one day at a time. Say something 
that'll wake them up to that concept and have them share their life each day. So they're investing in themselves so that we can preserve these families. So having the families involved are terribly important. I was doing a class in, um, in a major city not terribly long ago, and I'm getting ready for the class to begin in the morning. A police officer walks up to me, older police officer, probably in his mid-40s, and he walks up and he has a whole stack of those books that we're talking about, the Emotional Survival for Law Enforcement book. He has, I don't know, a little stack of them. And he goes, Dr. Gilmartin, can I impose upon you, sir? Would you do me the honor of signing these for me? I said, well, it would be my honor. Who can I make them out to? And he looks at me and he goes, my ex-wives. I said, your ex-wives, plural. He goes, yeah, I have three of them. I refer to them as P1, P2, and P3 for plaintiff one, plaintiff two, and plaintiff three because they're always suing me. So I said, they're going to get a class action suit against you. And I think he's being lighthearted. But then I realized he's not being lighthearted. I said, you really want me to sign books for your ex-wives? And he goes, yeah, I do. I said, can I ask you why? I've never been asked to do that before. I've never had that request. Why do you want to sign books for your ex-wives? He goes, because I just want to say, I'm sorry. I just want to say that our divorces were 100% my fault. I've ruined the marriages. They didn't. I don't want them feeling that it was some shortfall or some shortcoming on their behalf. I've ruined three good marriages. And I just want to say I'm sorry to them and give them closure. Now, I stop at this point because this is starting to scare me because it sounds like a cop who's contemplating closing up shop, basically, and we might have some self-destructive behavior taking place. So I said, so you just want to get closure on these relationships, huh? He goes, yeah, I'm blessed. I had three good women come into my life and agree to be my life partner. And I started families three times and I screwed it up three times. And I just want to say, I'm sorry. Now I'm sitting here feeling very uncomfortable with this. And I signed the third book. I said, but there's a fourth book. Who's this for? He goes, it's for my wife today. She's here. I brought my wife with me. I said, so number four? And he goes, no, number one. He goes, this is the first marriage that I'm actually an active participant in. This marriage is till death do us part. He goes, Doc, after my third divorce, I was so depressed. I was so down. I went to the employee's assistance program, and they put me into a support group with other cops, and we started discussing things, and they gave us a pile of books to read, one of which was yours, one of which was I Love a Cop by Ellen Kirschman, a number of other books. And for the first time in my life, I started understanding what was going on. I don't live my life the way I used to live it. I'm an active member of this marriage. He says, I love those other women, but I was not an active member because I didn't know what was going on. Then he says something. He goes, doctor, I learned this the hard way. Why the heck do we make the young cops learn it the hard way? Why can't we facilitate the learning curve and give them some information to save some of these police families? Why can't we do that? I said, well, if you're preaching to the choir here, son, that's what we're trying to get done. That's why we're doing the seminar today. But it amazes me how much wisdom our cops have who have lived this course But they get that wisdom by the time they're in their 50s. And many times it's cost them families, but most of the time it's cost them their health. Many times they're fighting these diseases of adaptation that actually shorten their life expectancy. And it really is a failure experience for the cop. Or we can make it a success experience with just a little bit of intervention. Wonderful. I know that from the back of the book it says, you know, Emotionalsurvival.com is your website. And uh, I think you've mentioned that you're in the process of rewriting this or some other book. Well, we're trying to tie in for the police officers some information that when a police officer practices officer safety and they have that elevated level of alertness, biologically, they have to undo that at the end of each shift or it leads to 
metabolic syndrome and diabetes and illness later in life. It has to be addressed. It's the stress reaction. It's actually the same thing bears go through prior to hibernation. The threat of winter is coming on. The bear has a surge of adrenaline. It pushes the blood glucose into the fat cells around the abdominal area, and the bear lives off these fat cells throughout the course of the winter during hibernation. That's a basic biological stress reaction, and cops have the exact same stress reaction. I think I mentioned it earlier. Uh, cops have constant secretion of adrenaline. Firefighters don't. They have it only when they're working a fire. That's why women buy calendars of firefighters. They don't buy calendars of cops. Nobody wants to see a calendar of cops with their shirts off. You know, I mean, that would be, what would you call a calendar of cops with their shirts off? You know, badges and bellies or something, you know, because <laughs> the cops infuse glucose in the abdominal area. It's not donuts. It's adrenaline. And we can undo that with very minimal intervention. If every cop in the world gave themselves 22 minutes a day of moderate exercise would knock the ball out of the park in terms of the prevention of diabetes, stroke, and heart disease, as well as depression, which leads to the suicides. Well, I thank you so much for your time. As I mentioned to you before, the book has positively affected the work I do with clients who are either spouses of law enforcement or law enforcement people. I am looking forward to the rewrite when you get it done. And I greatly thank you for the work you're doing and for taking the time to interview with me today. Well, thank you, Dr. Chase. Thank you very much. It's been my honor to speak with you. Keep up the good work on helping our first responders and, and their families. We'll do what we can. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Goodbye now. Dr. Kevin Gilmer is a behavioral scientist specializing in law enforcement and public safety issues. He is the author of the book, Emotional Survival for Law Enforcement a guide for officers and their families. He previously spent 20 years working in law enforcement in Tucson, Arizona. During his tenure, he supervised the hostage negotiations team and the behavioral sciences unit. He is a former recipient of the International Association of Chiefs of Police Parade Magazine, National Police Officer Citation Award for contributions during hostage negotiations. He presently maintains a consulting relationship with public safety and law enforcement agencies in the U.S., Canada, and Australia. The Department of Justice, FBI, Royal Canadian Mounted Police, New South Wales Police, and International Association of Chiefs of Police have published his work. He holds a doctoral degree in clinical psychology from the University of Arizona. He is a veteran of the U.S. Marine Corps and resides in Tucson, Arizona, and Sun River, Oregon. You've been listening to the On Your Mind podcast, offered by Journey's Dream, where we support people through mental health challenges to a place of true and lasting well-being. If you love our show, we invite you to visit onyourmindpodcast.org to join the conversation, access the show notes, and discover our helpful resources. Thank you for listening. 